Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the CX Goalkeeper podcast. Your host, Gregorio Leoni, will have a smart discussion with expert, thought leader and friends on customer experience, transformation, innovation and leadership. I hope you will enjoy the next episode. Ladies and gentlemen, today is really a big, big pleasure. I have Silvana Bullian with me. Hi, Silvana. How are you? Hi, Gregorio. Good morning. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you, Silvana. It's really great that you find time to discuss with me, first of all, about the European Customer Experience Organization, and then you selected a really, really interesting topic, CX leadership competences at managerial level. I think this is one key topic that it's really important to create really this nice and impactful customer experience transformation or in general transformation. But before we start deep diving in our discussion, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, sure I will do. Well, my name is Savannah, as you already mentioned. I'm German uh, with Croatian roots and based now in Madrid, where I've been living for almost 20 years. And uh, for also the same time or even before that, in, since 97, I'm actually engaged as a, as a consultant uh, for, for customer strategy topics. Back then, it was the big era of CRM implementations in Europe, where I started a, as a consultant to all, to all to do the change management process, the, the more strategic view on, on what CRM actually means for the company, not only implementing systems. And since then, um, I as a person, also my company has evolved to really to really serve this purpose to, to, to make the companies a better place for customers and employees because um, the customer-centric view is really taken into every single interaction that a customer has with a company, independent if it's via employees or digital, digital channels or whatever. So this was kind of our obsession because we have seen in the early days that so many companies started to focus only on the, tech, not on the technology or on the process optimization, but there was so much like endogamically uh, like, like, uh, uh, stuck in their own views because they didn't understand what it means to put themselves in the shoes of the customer. Uh, and we actually, nobody in the 90s talked about customer journeys. We started to talk about customer journeys in the, in the early 2000s or, or mid 2000s, right? But uh, in the first decade, but in, in, in 97, 98, um, when all these CRM projects were implemented, the technologies, nobody really um, understood the customer view because it was all about consolidating information. Um, yeah, having just one database and from there have personalized campaigns for, for customers. And this is not what customer centricity is about. So this is basically what we have done uh, since we exist as a company, because I founded my own company in 2002, Billion and Partners. And uh, we have offices in Madrid, in Barcelona, and then also in Germany, in, in, in Hamburg. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's how, how, how it evolved to have less and less the, te the, the, the technical view on, on customer topics and customer centricity and more the strategic um, yeah, reality from the customers and also from the employees' view to, to make it happen in organizations. Thank you very much, Silvana. And as you are mentioning uh, from Spain, I would say Encantado, much more <laughs> Spanish. I'm not so good at, at, uh, at these languages. I had some courses, but this is another big and long story. Uh, one question. Uh, we all know that your company is quite successful. And perhaps... The question that I have is, what are your customer asking to you? How, how can you differentiate yourself and then the customer select your company to do business with you? The usual starting conversation is, we've done everything. Methodology, measurement, uh, process des the design, customer journey design, customer personas, but still our culture is not customer centric. So we've done everything that we, that we should do and, and, and they actually use all the methods, journey mapping, persona, uh, the persona definition, jobs to be done method, um, uh, empathy maps. I mean, tons of materials, big PowerPoints, big ideas, but it did not 
actually go through the organization as a culture? How to do have this customer centric mindset that anybody independent, if this person works in customer experience or customer service or marketing or whatever, really understands what their role as an employee is in making a difference for customers. This is the usual conversation. So we did everything, but we're still not there. So what can we do? I think it totally makes sense. And uh, that's always what I'm saying. If I would, I would get $1 for each PowerPoint slide that I produced, yeah. then I would be millionaire or billionaire. And uh, therefore, PowerPoint in PowerPoint, everything sees pretty well. But yeah. then it's, it's also the execution, really important. Um, the next question that I would like to, to ask, and this is always I'm asking at the beginning, a bit to, to understand you also better. Uh, what are your most important values for you as a person, as Silvana, but also in your company? So really, it's, uh, we are very honest. We, nev we would never do anything for our customers that produces value for us, but not for the customer. That's why, for instance, we, we, we never engaged as, uh, as exclusive partners for a software something. So... The big players, um, all, they all have their like partner companies um, who implement sell their systems. We actually don't do that. Sometimes, I mean, in many cases, and when it comes to employee engagement, we actually work and recommend a company that doesn't work with consultants. They, also, they always want to have a direct contact with, with, with the end customer. And we recommend them because they're the best solution, even if they don't work on a partnership model. So for us as a company, and for me as a person, this is very important. It's we do what makes sense and gives value to our customers. We're not corporate centric there. We're really customer centric. Even if that sometimes means that we do less or we are out and others are in because it wouldn't make sense for the customer. So this is one of our key values. And uh, also to, to really understand, not um, oblige the customer to follow our method or the method because every company is different. They have a different standing where their culture currently is, well, how their employees are engaged to the company, um, how the, the customer relationships are, the, the, the complaints that are coming. And so really, there is no standard fit approach. You can have different phases because when you start, you need to analyze, right? Or do something to understand your, your customers and your, your employees, but there is not one method that, that fits everything. So it's really about letting the customer decide if they want to go more for an like evolution in terms of we've done some things, we want to improve, we need our pace, our own pace, and we don't want a revolution. Or sometimes they say, we want a revolution and start really from, from the green field and open up ourselves for both customer and employees and really from there transform. So. For us, it's also one of the other values, most important. The, we need to adapt as a, as a service provider to the pace of our customers and cannot oblige them to push them towards, this is the way and you need to do it like this and you need to do this in three months and this in five months and this in 10 months. For us, it hasn't worked. And it, it makes totally sense and elaborating a bit on, on what you were mentioning that at the end it's accepting diversity. This is also a value that it's extremely relevant for the European customer experience organization. And you are playing an important role in the European customer experience organization. Uh, why are you part of this great organization? <laughs> Actually, I have a long relationship in the past with, with Ricardo, as he is passionate as I am, and we were interacting, and he contacted me in the past years to, you know, to give some feedback on things that he was writing or thinking. And, and when he actually came up to me with this idea, I said, yes, this is what Europe needs, because all European, European companies uh, that we work for, that we interact with, they are so tired and sick of the Amazon, the Apple example, the Nordstrom's example, all, all these examples, they like, I mean, they like to see um, them as best cases and, and, and learn, but, but they are so much kind of tired of, of having examples that are not coming from Europe. And in Europe, we have so many examples of great companies, especially in the family-run businesses. They, they, you know, they don't talk that much about it, but when it comes to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the culture and how they see the customer as a person and the employee as a person, we have so much better examples than the US can, can position. 
past, but we talk, we, we don't talk about it. In Europe, we are more, you know, we are more reserved about, about talking about the things that we are doing, right? So also give the space for European-based companies to, to, to show what they do, how they do it, how they can learn from each other as a community. This is fundamental for Europe, fundamental, because we do have a different reality. We have a complete different reality when it comes to, to labor laws. We have a complete different reality when it comes to GDPR rules. We have a complete different reality when it comes to really also the, 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 the selling techniques, right? Or motivation techniques, because the American way is not the European way. We can learn from it, but you cannot adapt it. And all these campaigns that I have seen in, 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 in some European companies about employee engagement, that, 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 that take us as an example, for instance, an American company, well, there is some resistance in the, in, the, in the employee base because we as a person are different and we value other things and, and, and uh, other things are important for us, relevant for us. So I think it was the right timing and the clear need that in Europe, we have something own that, yes, learns from international best practices, but is also able to adapt it to the European reality. And it, it makes totally sense. Uh, you spoke also that you are common, you are working in Spain. Half of me is Italian, and I'm also looking at the Italian setup. At the end, there there are quite a lot of small enterprises, and the, the culture is really great because they are focused on family business, growing the family business, and, and this is something that is not comparable with uh, Apple, Amazon, Ritz Carlton, and all this, uh, this, this example that, that we are using. Speaking about the European customer organization, and uh, it's a fast growing uh, organization. And for all the, the audience listening to this podcast, it's free of charge. You don't need to pay to participate. And it's quite easy to, to start the collaboration because then you have the opportunity like I have now to speak with Silvana and have great interactions. Uh, Silvana, from your your point of view, what is the the most imp what you like most from the European Customer Experience Organization? It's really the, the the community that all of us who are participating actively, we do that out of a, a, a genuine interest and not looking for selling ourselves our services. We really look to contribute. So if you look at the contributions, look at the community members. Uh, the ambassadors that meet also once a month to, 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 to drive the organization and, and get more and more people on board is really about sharing. It's about sharing knowledge, is about uh, offering um, relevant content, about also um, introducing new people who, who start uh, being engaged with customer experience, give them the knowledge and the, and, and the ideas what it is, what it not is, because they have access to, to really interact with people who have been very many, many years uh, engaged in, in making customer experience real in, in their own organizations or, or, or as service providers. And this is the richness that you really have, uh, you, you can just reach out to people that, you, that give you the, the trust of that they know what they are talking about because Ricardo has been also very selective about who, who he's actually approaching to be an ambassador ambassador representing a market um, he would he doesn't accept any just yeah I'm interested I want to be an ambassador that doesn't work you really need to have the credentials and the experience to be able to be an ambassador for for your market for your country and this is I think it's it's, it's a very clear quality standard and it, it makes totally sense and I think this is ex exactly what what I really like is this discussion and creating value and this is also what I am trying to do with, with this podcast in collaboration with the European customer or customer experience organization and as, as you said at the beginning it's really important also the cultural point of view of this transformation and of this discussion on one side on this organization but on the other side to come to our business topic it's also how is it possible to create a culture and then really integrating and engaging also the manager, managerial level in customer experience? And we discussed in the pre-discussion, there are, for me, let's to, simp to extremely simplify, there are companies that start with um, a community of practice on customer experience. They start, 
and then they see oh they are successful and then other people start joining this um, this community of practice and then you can grow something other companies are more top down the ceo give the mandate please let's start and then you start creating something like um, a six manager or a vp of cx but it's important really that it comes into the culture of a company, this customer experience discipline. And you really are touching or willing to discuss about these competencies that are required. Could you please elaborate a bit on that? Mm -hmm. Before I start talking about the competences itself, I would like to actually explain how we came to really talking about these competencies and, 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 and why it was necessary and why, you know, why, why we kind of bumped into it uh, uh, during the work that we have done for, for, for customers. So. As you say, the usual thing is people say we need to do something. We need to be more customer centric. We need to start working on customer experience. We are too product focused. Um, the world has changed. So, so, so we need to work differently and, and, and think differently in order to be relevant for customers in the future because we do not want to be in, in, the, in, the, in the price war. We have a quality product, a quality company, a quality brand. But we're still focused too much on what we have, what we offer as a product, and we need to be more customer centric now. So, yes, there is a need both from top down because they see it and they want something. And usually they start, you know, to find a department or people or, 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 they, or they build a department from, from zero or they say, look, customer marketing. Yeah, you marketing people take care of it or our our bottleneck is our customer service because we are bad so we start an operation so there are different different like initial steps of 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 starting to work in in customer centricity or customer experience so what happens then so these people who are engaged with a project to start they start to collect feedback start measuring um, start uh, interviewing customers looking at the internal processes looking at customer feedback and so they discover many things that need to be changed. It goes into cultural change, but it goes into structural change. And once you start talking about structural change, you have all these company politics around. So on the manager level, oh, but that's my people, that's my department. Why are you saying this? You can't make a decision, even if this is the customer, what they observe, but there's a justification. So you start all these you just observe all these conversations around the silos, the responsibilities. This is my battlefield, not yours. Or don't put your nose in, in, my, in my stuff because this is what you do when you start listening to customers and employees and, and to start discovering the things that need to be changed. You actually do it cross, in, uh, cross company, <laughs> cross departments. And this, this is when the problems start. So we've, we've then understood, okay, we need to work with the people so that they understand this is not about this is not about who's now leading and who can say something who can't and who needs the approval of 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 the boss above and they need to talk in between because they're all first liners and the management board but then here's the marketing guy here's the sales guy here's the, the finance guy whatever so so to have this discussion out of uh, me as a person, you need to always focus on the need for the transformation, the need for change as a company interest. So when we started doing this, again, we understood, yes, there is consciousness about it. But again, people have their own agendas because the system itself trains them to look for their objectives because they are being valued or, or the performance review is based on their objectives. And if these objectives are company department wise and not with an overall objective in terms of strategy but also an overall objective of being more customer centric then we have an issue so looking at all these rational and emotional um, like obstacles that that we've seen we said okay let's find another approach really working with the managers as people and understanding where they come from as uh, as persons to really and 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 and, and how they lead right and then we started to look at methodologies that would actually measure customer-centric leadership competencies. And we started to look at different HR tests. There are many psychological tests about values, about competences in general, about uh, who you are as a person in terms of personality checks, but nothing really focused on customer-centric competencies to, to select that. So we said, okay, if it doesn't exist, we just create it. So we actually draw from our view more from the 
project experience and uh, the, the in the field experience as, as consultant and trainers, we actually looked for HR experts who come from the HR and psychological world, which is a totally different world. <laughs> and I think back 15 years back, customer experience and HR was always separated. Now we see more and more that these initiatives about a cultural transformation towards customer centricity is actually co-led by the business areas and HR. So this is a good sign already. But in order for HR people to accept you and your methodology, it needs to come from HR because they start talking about competencies, about, um, about observable behaviors, about personality. So you really need to have the psychological and HR view on it. So we just, you know, we, we put this team together coming from business, from the project experience, from, from the customer's reality, and from the HR knowledge. And then we actually created a methodology that would fit both things, that somebody who's not from HR understands the competences we have selected, and we have grouped them in, in five different areas. The first one is really to have this attitude towards customer centricity, really to like to serve customers. So as, an, as, as a first part, in terms of, I really like to serve. The other one is about uh, CX focus, also being able to focus on what is important for customers and then um, empower employees to go that way. CX drive is more the let's innovate, let's be more revolutionary, let's see what's the next thing because we cannot just we cannot just work on the basics. Sometimes we need to reach higher levels. Then it's about uh, a CX connect, which is more the 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 um, the, the, the emotional part, right? It's about connecting with people as persons, people, customer, but also people, uh, people, employees, and in order to have them on board, right? So, so these are the different groups that we have defined where we have selected concrete competencies. For instance, uh, I recognize my employees or I, I'm, I'm able to, to transmit a clear vision of customer centricity or um, I really uh, have, have also emotional control of myself because we cannot start yelling at people because something went wrong and, and, and we do not learn from mistakes. So we really, it's uh, for the leader, for the CX leader assessment now, we have, we have uh, 25 clear competences identified that each leader has a test. You do an online test and you receive your report and see what, is, what are your development areas and what not. Because this is focused then on really being able to lead a customer-centric transformation and lead my teams to, to make customer experience a reality in my organization. And so far, it works pretty well. We have tested it with a, with a, with a benchmark, with a control group, and more and more companies really use it to, to develop their leaders in this customer-centric transformation. But again, the way how we came to it was also co-creating with our customers because we've seen, we've seen a need. We've analyzed in the market, didn't find anything. So we created it with people who are experts in more the HR part and, and, and we from the, from the CX part. And it makes totally sense to have uh, collaboration in order to, to create such yeah. tests. And uh, based on what you explained, and it's, it's really, really brilliant what, what you're saying, at the end, it's the outcome. It's, it's a number, it's qualitative, it's quantitative KPIs. W what is the outcome of this, of this report? The outcome is yes. We, we have a you have a percentage of uh, how your readiness is for for customer experience leadership. So you get a percentage, and and we have it like in three areas. You can be the advanced, which is actually very high. You can be in the middle, or you can be underdeveloped. But for each one of the competences, you actually see if you're underdeveloped, if you're optimal, or also if you if you're kind of uh, over delivering. Because and this is also very important to understand customer centricity. Again, all of us who are in this business, we always say it's not about giving the customer what he or she wants. It's about giving the customers things that they want that are relevant for them and, they're ready, and they are also willing to pay for it. And, and this is why we, we're talking about CX focus as well. It's not about saying yes to everything. Also, as you don't say yes to everything that your employees want, because otherwise you can go, go bankrupt as a company. You always need to be able to, to put it into the right balance. This way, again, being... 100% customer orientated, sometimes it's not good because you might lose the focus that you also need to fulfill with, with what you as a company, as a brand stand for. So it must fit into what you are, right, as a company. So, so we're really looking at, so development areas exist for both. If you are 
too low or if you're too high. So the optimum level is really the, the, the balance in the middle that we have for each one of the competences. So you have a, so in, in terms of quantitative, yes, you can say there is a, there is a percentage as an index that you, that you have. You can be a 90%, you can be 70%, for instance. Um, and you have the, for each one of the competencies, the evaluation where you stand and recommendations, what you can do in terms of action planning. And then you as a manager can decide, well, if you want to have a coach who works with you, if you want to, to have this open conversation with your team and share the results with them and say, look, for instance, the, the recognition to employees, because employee experience is fundamental for customer experience as well. That's why, again, you know, the, the, this, this combo, customer experience, employee experience, leadership, because as an employee, I'm engaged. If I, if, if, I, if I feel valued as a person, I can contribute, I can grow as a, as a person, as a professional organization. And I have leaders who support me in this career development that I have as a person, right? So, so we cannot separate these topics one from each other. So there you have the possibility to also share that with your team and, 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 and open up and look, look, this came out. This is my result. I really want to work on this. And I want to involve you in, in defining some action, how, can, how I can improve my leadership skills. I mean, this is, it's a lot about openness and, and, and willing to change and transform. Exactly. I think two questions will follow. First, the first one is, um, you said you, you are running this, this test, people are doing that. Where do you see or did you find out the, the biggest gaps? Uh, there is no pattern behind, Gregorio. It really depends on the person. I remember that one person who actually uh, is a customer experience manager in an organization, I mean, he had very, very low very, very low results. But you know what happened? In this case, and this happens a lot in companies, this person was absolute an expert and brilliant in all the theories around customer experience. So in, in, in understanding what customers need in terms of this is the customer journey, this is what it needs. So, so in terms of the doing part, excellent. So probably if he had, if he would have done the test about CX talent, which we also have as for employees, he probably would have had brilliant results. But this is not what people need from a leader. A leader means you help others, you coach others to get to the next level. It's not about what you know. It's about how you can lead and, and coach people in your team to get to the next level. So you need to, and this is, this is a gap in the organizations that we see because people are promoted because of their knowledge and their functional expertise and, and technical you know, knowledge and everything. But this is not what teams need. Teams need somebody, okay, he or she should know what they're talking about. But, but the first thing is, give me freedom, give me empowerment, coach me and give me possibilities to, 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 to get to, to where you are in terms of knowledge. But so the roles change. So that's why it's so important to understand that Customer-centric leadership, there are many competencies that also come from general leadership skills in terms of motivating employees. You don't need to know, you do not need to know if, if you should measure a touch point experience in a transactional way or a relational way, how to do the NPS or not. This is what your people should do. But you as a leader, you need to really engage with them to go that way and support them. And many times also, um, back them in terms of internal politics and companies because there are so many around right so, so this is actually the role of the leader not being the technical expert but the people expert uh, sure and uh, and it it makes totally sense that at the end always we are always saying i for the mindset and not for the skills because you can train on the skills and then at different levels you need to show different expertise level more on the leadership side if you're speaking about leaders um, and one, one more thing one more thing that you one, one, I, I actually i just i just remembered now to, to uh, what there is one interesting observation we also had because when we compared people who work in in big companies like multinational companies mm, uh, also who are in, 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 in the stock markets and people who work in family-run businesses there was a clear difference because because those leaders who were representing family-run businesses, uh, even if they have many, many employees, but still they're, they're family-run and not, and not in the stock exchange, they had higher levels of, uh, of customer-centered leadership competencies than those who, who, who work in the big multinationals. And this again shows you 
it's, it's again the reflection of the culture in the company. If my culture is the guy who sells more will always be the best and will be promoted independent of how he or she sold it versus, oh no, for us, it's more important how we do it and that the customer is really happy. And it's not about our sales process. It's about making the customer happy. I mean, you see clearly differences in terms of what the culture represents and the results in the leadership assessment. This was interesting to observe. Yes, and uh, I think what you are saying, uh, a story that I heard and I was not aware of, but now I am, I am really thinking about it and it makes totally sense about employee experience. Um, in some companies, your login, it's your name. And this is something that you remember and it's quite easy. In quite a lot of companies, you are a number. Yeah. And employees, Terrible. the first thing that I'm doing in the morning is writing the number that they represent in order to start working. And this is the first time I found out, I said, oh, but this, this already started yeah. making the difference. Absolutely. And look, these are the small details that make the difference. Exactly. The small details. Exactly. And uh, the last question I would like to, to ask on, on this topic is is there really a willingness to change because you are doing the these, let's say exams and then there are outcomes and then uh, the the work starts how are you coping with this then change that you need to to drive in in these companies here the the fundamental role is the one of the of the ceo because many times you see so we i've uh, i've seen management teams who would work many years in transforming the company towards a more customer-centric culture using data because they always ask you for data. So you, so you, you need to fulfill more the emotional part and also the, 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 the facts and figures part because um, some people just look at the facts and figures, right? So even in management teams, you see those who are more emotionally driven and others who are more you know, KPI driven. And, and, this, and this needs to be like this because that's why they're a management team and they're diverse. So you, so you have to have these different views. But there the key is that at one moment when, when you see that there is no progress because as you said in the beginning, it stays nice on a PowerPoint, the CEO needs to really be very, very clear on that and you know, say, no, this is what we're we going to do. And there is no discussion about it because some things can't be discussed. They just need to be implemented and be lived. And if it doesn't work, you're out. We've seen companies where, 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 where managers were then said, look, this is our strategy. This is the way, this is what we do. So you decide if you're going to be part of this or not. But if you don't want to be part of this, that's fine. We just get to an agreement and you're out. And that's very transparent, that's very clear. Because otherwise, if you have people all the time on board on, on managerial levels who do not share this need and view of, of customer centricity, sooner or later, this will be a boomerang. So you, you, you really may need to make sure that the management team needs to be aligned, fully aligned, fully aligned towards the rest of the organization. Surely, and it makes totally sense. At the end, what I'm always saying is, from now um, employee point of view is, I married my wife and not my company. That's the first. And on the other side, you can look at from the business side, the business or the, the company didn't manage the employee. And therefore, if you don't agree anymore, then there are opportunities to change. Yeah. And, and therefore, you should do that. It was really an, a great discussion. Now, some questions to learn a bit more about you, Silvana, and also how you came to all this great idea and, and concept. The first question I would like to ask is, is there a book where you say, this, is, this helped me to grow, or it's, something, it's a book that I would like to suggest to the audience? Yes, and it has nothing to do with customer experience. <laughs> Even better. It's really, I last see, uh, I don't know if you, Chris Lowney, Heroic Leadership. I really recommend that to, uh, to everybody to read, but see, I'm a personal fan of, of the Jesuits. See, I'm, yes. see I, 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 I'm a believer. And if you, and, 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 and Chris Lowney was, a, uh, uh, he actually, he was a Jesuit and then, then, then got out of the, of the, of the Jesuit uh, community and was a, a top manager in one of the big investment firms of the world. I don't know which one it was, one of the biggest. And then he wrote a book about uh, heroic leadership. And if you read this book, it really gives you the combination of 
value uh, what are you as a person and uh, value i mean you asked me the question what your values are so values is very important and how to understand that leadership means to serve not to not 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 to not to give orders leadership is about serving others and and this view it's something that that for me personally was the you know the the the, the before and after to really understand what leadership in the future sh should be able to do for, for the companies they serve and for the people they serve. So heroic leadership by Chris Launi, this is absolutely my, my recommendation. Thank you very much. And I think it's, it's, it's really what you're saying, it's, it's really important to really understand what is the real role of, of leaders. And it's exactly what you, what, what you said. The, the last question I would like to ask before, sorry, the second last question I would like to ask is, if somebody would like to contact you, what's the best way? Well, the, the, the Exco, LinkedIn, and my email address is uh, s.bullion at bullionandpartners.com. I, mean, I think it's easy to find me for those who are really interested. I, I do have a Twitter account, but I don't really use it that much. So I'm, I'm, I'm linked. I have no Facebook. I have no Instagram, nothing of that. So the easiest way to reach me is really LinkedIn, send me an invitation and I, and, and, and I usually accept the people who, who, who contact me if I see they're, they're, they're professionally related to, to, yeah, to, to what we stand for. Thank you. And uh, uh, Silvana is also extremely active on the European Customer Experience Organization exactly. community. And there it's quite easy to, to contact also Silvana. The last question is this, always the same question I am asking. Is Silvana's golden nugget? It's something that we discussed or something new that you would leave to the audience? Golden nugget in terms of? It's the last piece of wisdom that you would like to share with the audience. Yes. Okay, yeah. Love your customer more than his or her share of wallet, her wallet. Thank you very much. As usual, I am not commenting Silvana's golden nugget because it was Silvana golden nugget. The last thing I want to say is thank you very much, Silvana, for your time. Thank you, Gregorio. Um, and I'm happy to, to spread the word and yeah. Be, be there for you if, if you need any more input, because this is what we're all here for, to really, to really make the corporate world a better world for both employees and customers. Thank you. Thank you, Silvana. And also thank you very much to the European Customer Experience Organization to making this possible. We are uh, running a collaboration and I have the opportunity to really interview thought leaders like Silvana in customer experience. But we saw it's not only customer experience, it's about business and creating better businesses. And it's what we want to achieve as human beings. Concluding also to the audience, thank you very much for being here, for participating, to listening to this, um, to this discussion, to watching the YouTube video. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Grazie mille. Arrivederci. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the word of mouth. Subscribe it. Share it. Until the next episode, please don't forget, we are not in a B2B or B2C business. We are in a human-to-human -human environment. Thank you.